Glenn and I are going to be helping you lead a tour to uh, Cornwall, which we're really excited about. Yes, yeah, so. going to be down. Uh, we're leading the tour in West Penworth, the southern most southwesterly tip of Cornwall. And what's great about West Penworth is there are more sacred sites per square mile than anywhere else on the planet. Yeah. So it's a really, really special place. And it's one of our favorite places. Makes it even better then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah. you two now work as tour guides and you, and you spend a lot of time taking people to these sacred sites, is that right? Yeah, we have a, a tour mm -hmm. business called Journeys with Soul and uh, we, we facilitate tours. They're all sort of tours um, visiting sacred sites and learning from the sacred sites, whether it be in England, uh, whether it be Ireland, Scotland, Malta, Egypt, all the places we've gone to, or the crop circles. This year we're going to France. Uh, we're going to France and starting in Paris, going to Chartres, and then going to Normandy and Brittany. Then we're going to be taking the uh, ferry over to Guernsey and staying there for three days and headed from there to um, the south of England, going to Winchester and Salisbury and Stonehenge and visiting ancient sites at all of the places. And a busy summer ahead. Sacred sites, yeah, we do. It's really exciting. I think that when our ancestors built these fantastic sacred sites, what they were doing, I, I suspect they were multi-purpose. Um, I suspect they were used like a modern cathedral is for all sorts of purposes. A modern church or cathedral is used for christenings, weddings, community events, uh, marriages, burials, Sunday services, worship, all these things go on within this one building. Blessings. Blessings. <laughs> uh, and I believe that the stone circle builders, the builders of the ancient monuments, were using them for a variety of different reasons. And uh, I really believe that the, the design of the structures and also their locations uh, was very, very important. And also the type of stone they used in the s structures. Um, so for example, uh, I think uh, the location was because they always chose a site where there was underground water, and they not only just underground water, but underground water which was is potentized, energized by earth energy currents. That means that there, there's an upwelling of energy, energy vortex or a, 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 a blind spring, whatever you want to call it. And if you build a structure on that spot, you fix it because those blind springs can actually move. But when you put stones in the ground, it fixes it. And if you put stones in a circle, then, and those stones are conductive of energy, so uh, which they invariably are most stone circles are either sarsen stone which is sandstone which is quartz which is silicon or they are granite which is heavily studded with crystal we all know the properties of crystal uh, i mean uh, th th this is being recorded on the silicon chips it's uh, our whole modern society is now crystal powered uh, because crystals have memory and so the stones draw up uh, the earth energy. They also conduct down celestial energies and blend them. And if you make a circle, um, you create like a cauldron or container within which there's an energy interference pattern, which if we could see it, and some people can, it would look like a mandala or like a crop circle pattern. Uh, it, it, because the, 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 well, we can come on to crop circles. But, um, and so if then we are energy. When we walk into that space, suddenly our energy field is being interfered with 
in a positive way by the energy mandala that's been created by the placement of stones and the upwelling of energy. So I think they were deliberately, our ancestors were deliberately working with these currents of energy within the earth, with these currents drawn down from the cosmos. I, I don't know what their purposes were, I can only speculate, rites of passage, spiritual awakening, um, initiations, uh, honorary, um, being on, honoring uh, ceremonies to their ancestors, uh, connecting to source, to God, whatever. Um, but those, and meditations, of course, those actions would have been empowered by uh, the structure they'd created. So they're, they're designed for conscious human beings as a sort of resonance chamber. I do believe that uh, the sacred sites are designed to impact human beings. Uh, yes, very much like a like a resonance chamber, um, or almost sort of like a biofeedback system as well. If you go in somewhere like West Kennet Long Barrow and tone, uh, you get a great acoustic uh, feedback, and I think you're getting like it's biofeedback. Uh, so you're able to sort of uh, work on whatever issues you, you need to work on in a powerful setting. We found that, haven't we? Absolutely. And I also think that, um, you know, we talked today about our, the power of intent. And when we have an intention that it gives, it magnifies what it is that we do. And I think that no matter what it was that they wanted to do, that that the depth of just the creation of these places was so intense that it just must have magnified, you know, whatever it was that they wanted to have happen there. Right. And you can still feel the energy at these places and utilize it and you know, you can meditate there, you can have ceremony there, you can you can create your own intent and still interact with the sacred sites today. It works with you. It does. Do you think that the ancients were aware that humanity was going to go through a kind of dark period and forget and that they were leaving messages for us as well in constructing these stone circles? Or they were just doing them for that purpose and it just happens to be that they're still remaining? What's your view on that? I'm not sure that they did it, uh, you know, it's very easy for us to think that everything's in relationship to us, <laughs> That's a, it's sort of a, a human condition, um, but I think that their intention was absolutely to create something that would last, and, uh, and it, it has, and unfortunately not as well as we would have loved. <laughs> and what's your take on how they built these things? Because it's like the crop circles, which we'll talk about, as you said in a moment, but people come back to the practical down there and say, well, how did they move these 100 ton stones? How did they work out the alignment so precisely? Mm. So what's mm -hmm. your view of this? How did, how, how? Yeah, how how the ancient monuments were constructed really is, well, of course, it's open to tremendous speculation um, but when you look at some of the uh, precision particularly say for example in South America the precision uh, and the close alignment and some of the stones and how the stones have been cut or worked um, my, my feeling is that uh, our view our conventional view of history is way way too narrow you know, we've been told uh, we are the uh, zenith of uh, our development. Uh, we've mm -hmm. de developed uh, through cavemen, and we're now the pinnacle of achievement. I really think this has to be considered as rubbish now. Um, when we look at the evidence around the world, either there have been a series of civilizations, um, the same lineage of people, but who were kept being knocked back by catastrophes, either natural catastrophes, such as volcanic eruptions, um, or they were knocked back by catastrophes of their own creation, 
for example, um, the natural catastrophes could well be volcanic eruption. There's evidence now from that the 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 the, the stone circle um, stone circles were seem to have been abandoned um, around about. Sort of, well, somewhere between 1500 and 1000 BC. And from um, fossil records, there's now uh, evidence that there was a seven year period when there were no growth rings in trees. Th that would imply that there was no sun for seven years, possibly because there was such a massive volcanic eruption, possibly from Santorini, and the sky was blackened out with ash for a seven year period. Imagine if that happened today. We had no sun, no power. You couldn't grow crops because th there was no sunshine. And so many people would die. A few would probably survive. Those that survived would only have sort of a, a, a vague, m well, not a vague memory. Initially, they'd have a memory of what had happened. But because they were not back in survival, ensuing generations would be in survival mode. and. All of our knowledge of our modern society would pretty much get forgotten or um, relegated to myth and legend. And I think the same thing has happened. Um, well, and it could be too that uh, if there are other, are other species on other planets or whatever and they knew that it was an empty earth, I don't think it's necessarily that we were the same lineage. I think that there's a possibility that there could have been other lineages as, from, as well. From, from extraterrestrial yeah. kind of yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, and that's that's quite possible. I think when we when we say that it's this way, that we don't know. <laughs> no, that's right. It could be the same progression, same lineage of the human race, or as you say, it could be um, that there were other races from somewhere else yeah. that lived here before. Um, it could be that there was interbreeding um, between off-planet beings and humans. Uh, I don't know, uh, but when we look um, at the, the technology that appears to be necessary to create some of these sacred sites, uh, the way in which the stones were so precisely cut, the way they are fitted together, uh, some appear to have been um, cut with laser type equipment w w you know our conventional history does not allow for that to be the case now I think rather than saying therefore that evidence ignore it or that can't be true well probably our world view is what is at fault and we need to re change our world view uh, it, that's more and more evidence seems to be coming forward to, to say that we need to uh, redefine our world view of history. Um, I agree. Yeah, and I think that joining together at events like Megalithomania, Earth Spirit Conferences, uh, the crop circle lectures and that happen every summer when we join together, and share our views, and and there are just some wonderful people who have done such great research, and you know that they're really digging deep and and coming up with some amazing evidence of uh, other longer longer lifespans than we could ever imagine, and it it's really exciting. It's just you know just getting out of our our boxed view that we were all brought up with. And, you know, for some of us, it was easier than it was for yeah. others. <laughs> and there's people kind of going through it. You can see people at all sorts of stages, can't yes. you? Yes. Whether they're just kind of waking up to, oh, hang on, it's not true, or they've been down the road a little bit right. and they're questioning stuff in a different way. <laughs> yes. It, it's, uh, it's exciting to, to, to s see the, uh, the new ideas coming forward. It's also very sad that most of those groundbreaking ideas have to come from independent researchers because the academic world is really sort of blinkered and funding is only comes for certain directions of research and people's careers are on stake at stake if 
a new idea threatens the status quo. Um, so, but I feel all mm -hmm. that is started, starting to be shaken loose, particularly mm -hmm. through dissemination of internet, through the, uh, information through the internet. Mm -hmm. It's change, the inf internet is changing our world mm -hmm. very, very quickly. Um, and mostly in positive ways, I feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think the stars and the sun and the moon were so important to the megalith builders? You know, our ancestors, um, I believe, although they were very sophisticated, I think they were much more in tune with nature and the cycles of the natural world both on this planet and in the cosmos than we are. Uh, we seem to have really divorced ourselves from <clears throat> the, the seasons um, and we all know how we do this. Uh, we've divorced ourselves pretty much from the heavens. Uh, I believe that the our ancestors who built the ancient sacred sites were very much in harmony with um, the natural world. And so it was important to them whether it was day or night. It was important to them whether it was spring or summer or autumn or winter. And we know that it was important because the, um, the, the uh, solstices, the equinoxes, and the cross quarter days were fe celebrated as festivals. Uh, they were really important turning points within the year. Um, so we know that the natural yearly cycle was important. And uh, if you spend a lot of time outside on the earth, I think you have a natural sort of feeling, empathy with the the resonance with the energy of the earth because in actual fact i mean we come from the earth we are of the same frequency as the earth particularly it appears uh, that when we're in a state of meditation our frequency frequency of our brain waves is the same as that of the heartbeat of the earth or the frequency of the earth and so we come into resonance with it uh, our ancestors knew this i believe and they also observed the sun and the moon. They, 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 they looked at the sky and so, you know, they, they, you've got all the stars that they, I believe, were important and they're marked out uh, by various alignments at many, many um, ancient sacred sites. And the sun and the moon, of course, were so important. I mean, they, they're so important to us today, even though we don't acknowledge it quite so much, you know. Um, the, 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 when the sun rises and when it sets and where it rises and sets on the horizon tells us where we are within that yearly cycle. It's really important to know if you're living in harmony with yeah. the earth, what's coming up in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. um, particularly in terms of growing crops and shelter. Um, the moon is really important. We found this with the moon with earth energies, haven't we? The cycle of the, the monthly cycle yeah. um, influences the, it, w w when the moon is um, waxing and up to full moon, the, en the earth energy is strongest. And so if you want to utilize that energy, it's really important to know what phase the moon is in. Well, also, the, our ancestors didn't have, you know, the modern tools that we have today you would have used the, the um, celestial heavens for navigating. You would have used, uh, you would have read everything to plan out your entire calendar for your year. You know, you would have been using where the sun was, where the moon was, where you were in the month to grow your vegetables, to, you know, harvest your vegetables, to do everything. And uh, I think that they were aware to probably to plant when when it was waxing and, you know, to do harvesting when it's waning and all sorts of great things. And uh, so it's just obvious that they would have revered the sun and the moon because they depended on them. And we know this, of course, from um, looking at 
ancient sacred sites, there are alignments repeatedly. Uh, if we're looking at Neolithic sacred sites, uh, the, 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 all of them appear to be aligned uh, to celestial events. So whether it be to midwinter sunrise or Beltane sunrise or a moonset, uh, and many of them mark all of them within the year. Uh, Avebury, for example, or Stonehenge, mark all those calendar dates uh, by the alignment of stones. Uh, and we see this in um, all over the world. Um, you, you, we're, we're going to be going to Karnak next week, and we're we meet up with Howard Crowhurst, who's done some great research on the, the, the alignments of the stone rows in Karnak, uh, sh showing that the people that constructed those 11,000 stones um, were aligning uh, to the heavens because uh, the sun and moon were so important to them. Given that they're are kind of crossovers from all the different cultures and that they all built these sort of stone circles and they all seem to have seemingly advanced technology <laughs> and they all line up to the various <laughs> constellations. Do you think that there was an overriding parent culture way back in antiquity or that they, we all kind of naturally came to the same conclusions <coughs> yeah, uh, individually? What's your view on that? The, the answer <laughs> is I don't know, <laughs> but um, there could be a parent culture, but there could also be, you know, it's just like the hundredth monkey effect. Um, and we've learned about water and how it stores memory and, you know, water travels all around the earth and, you know, that we're picking things up on a subconscious level. But there could have still been a mastermind, whether whether we're picking it all su up all subconsciously, it's, um, you know, we don't know, except that I think it's such a miracle that we are all, you know, in balance because of a, because our bodies work perfectly, mm. you know, that they want to come back to a state of being well. And we don't think about that, it just happens. And with the earth, it's the same thing. The earth wants to be in a state of balance at all times. And I think that the people who built the stone circles, they were, they, that was their desire too, that they wanted things to be well, or they wouldn't have, have built these structures, that there was something inherently good in it. And uh, I, it's really just hard to know whether there is a mastermind or whatever, but whatever, whether we, whether we are all it, you know, and we're all just these cells in this huger being, <laughs> I don't know. Glenn, you've done, you've done work on Earth energies in terms of um, scientific studies with regards to crop circles and, and the water, the underground water. Do you think that um, more and more uh, as, we, as we progress that uh, these energies will be able to be recorded scientifically, more scientifically? What we, what we know um, is that, uh, well, no, let's start this way. <clears throat> We know that there's water, there's uh, potentized water, that is water that's um, energized by earth energy currents under every sacred site in the world. I know of no sacred site that does not have potentized water beneath it. Um, from the research I did back in uh, the 90s, um, I discovered that 96% of all crop circles occur above potentized water. And I think that, that that's important, the crop circles need that to occur. Now, I, at the moment, um, that's, um, 
the, the only um, real way that that can be that NG can be detected um, is through s magnetometers can give you readings. Uh, you can get readings of um, atmospheric ions. You can get radiation counts. But there isn't actually any sort of equipment at the moment that can really pick up what we would call Earth energies. There is by putting probes into the ground. Um, but not through any sort of a portable equipment that's easily usable. Um, I'm sure this is just around the corner. Um, there are some sort of prototype models out there uh, that look promising. Uh, we, you know, it's interesting because um, we all the time look for our society really needs things that are scientifically provable that we can read on the machine and get results again and again and again. You know, we can pick these up through dowsing, but of course dowsing is not acceptable to the scientific uh, mainstream. Uh, what's interesting, what we can prove so far are um, results. So for example, um, great work by John Burke that's uh, listed in his book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty. Um, John Burke, who n noticed that uh, through growing on crops, uh, what he did, he, 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 people sent um, seeds from crop circles to him and uh, Dr. Levengood in the US. And um, they grew on seeds from the crop circles and actually grew on seeds from the same field but outside the crop circle. And they found that if those crop circles occurred in um, uh, a crop where the seed head was already fully formed and ripe, then those seeds uh, germinated faster at a higher rate, grew quicker, and had an increased yield. Um, now that to me, it's really uh, important information that we should be following up with research. Uh, he um, developed, uh, John Burke developed a machine that could mimic that, um, but the biochemical agro bio agriculture industry didn't want that to get out because then people wouldn't have to buy their chemical fertilizers and insecticides, etc. So it's pretty much uh, kept on squashed. But, so John actually then went to look at sacred sites. And what he did, he um, took seeds to certain locations at sacred sites, for example, in Avebury, um, behind in, in the Southern Circle, uh, just by the uh, marker stone that marks where the obelisk was, there are three concrete discs on the ground. They mark shallow pits that uh, archaeologists found and nobody knows what these pits were for. Well, John laid out seeds um, at dawn um, because he discovered from, he, he was a guy who worked with machinery, he said he, he didn't sense energies, um, he didn't douse, he, he had his machine, machine um, s to give readings and he discovered that there was a spike in natural, naturally occurring atmospheric ions just after dawn. Um, and so he laid out seeds in these pits and he had control ones in his hotel room. And then he grew on these seeds in the laboratory and found the same results as he was getting with crop circle trials, that the seeds that he laid out for maybe just 20 minutes in the shallow pits at Avebury germinated faster, grew quicker, and had increased yield when it came to time for harvest. He did the same thing on top of the Great Pyramid at Giza. He did it at uh, Machu Picchu, Cahokia Mounds, uh, various sacred sites around the world. This is fantastic. Um, I think this is something we really need to be paying attention to now because if we can make um, the yield from our crops uh, increased harmlessly without genetic modification, without the application of chemicals that are poisoning our um, water supplies. This has to be a good thing. 
Um, and at the moment, there's uh, the only people researching things like this are a few independent individuals who are having to finance it themselves. Um, and it's, it's a hope of mine that maybe we can um, get this information out wider um, in the world because it's a, you know, John speculated in his book that this was a practical reason for Avebury, as well as it being a spiritual temple, as well as it being, you know, really important for society on, on a, a, a spirit level, but it was as a practical reason people from far and wide would travel along the Ridgeway path and come to Avebury to potentize their seeds and then go home and, 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 and sow them and get an increased yield. On Belty. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably the best time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, great stuff. Fascinating. So here we are, it's 2012, the much awaited 2012. Where do you see yourselves after the winter solstice this year and beyond into 2013? You, you know, um, We've all been waiting for 2012 for a long time, and now it's here. What we've been feeling personally is that uh, what 2012 is calling us in particular to, to stay open, to be able to respond quickly to change. Uh, and that's what we're doing. Um, our, where we live is changing, um, we're just staying open to what we should do and where we should be. Um, where we'll be at the end of the year, where we'll be in 2013, I can't say because... Keep your wits uh, about you and be flexible. <laughs> and, 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 and trust uh, your, your intuition, yeah. really go with your guidance. You know, we're, we're being called to be spiritual warriors now to be strong in what it is that we believe in and um, and not have to back everything up that we believe with uh, scientific evidence or wait for approval from a community to say, oh yes, what you're believing is right or whatever. You know, we have to start acting now on what it is that we've learned and not keep examining our belly buttons forever. You know, it's time to really get into action and to do things when it feels right. You know, not not because you have to or not because you think that someone else will think that that's a good thing to do. You know, it's time to really trust yourself, be strong. Yeah, what's that? Uh, I can't remember who said it, but we are the people we've been waiting for. On that note. Lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, Ben yeah. and Cameron, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you.